welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit MacroHive.com. So greetings, David. As usual, it's fantastic to have you back on the podcast. Thanks, Bilal. Great to see you. It's good to talk again. I, I went back and listened uh, to our previous one. I can't believe it was two and a half years ago. Yeah, two recorded and a half years the last ago. One. Yeah, time flies. And <laughs> uh, and yet it all sounded pretty relevant. You, you've been listening to it. It sounded like we knew what we were talking about. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, let's, you know, you know, since two and a half years ago, things have moved on in terms of uh, central banks and so on. You know, the Fed has hiked rates quite significantly. Now everyone's talking about they're, they're, they're going to cut rates over the course of this year at some point. You know, we had the BOJ recently uh, end its negative rates policy for the first time in, in a long, long time. So they've hiked. Um, I mean, where's your head at with sort of central bank policy at the moment? Yeah, you know, when we talked, this, I think it was September 2021, right? We had been on the, the panel together in, I think, June, and I had said, maybe this time's different. Maybe they're going to let inflation run, in which case it's, you know, eventually the, they're going to have to raise rates and more aggressively than anybody thought, which turned out, you know, that was kind of what happened. They let it run. The, the sort of, you know, intentionally or not, the average inflation targeting, we're going to let it run hot for a little while. They did. It got hot. And then they had to respond, sort of my, you know, my my catchphrase, uh, what if it works? And it worked. And then you had, you're so far behind your policy rate, so negative real that you end up thinking you know, the, the difference, and this comes back to the Bank of Japan, as over time, eventually, I think Catherine Mann from the Bank of England was the first one to say it. But then Jay Powell himself said it on the panel at Sintra. There's a difference between tightening and tight. And that, you know, yeah. first move higher in rates didn't necessarily mean you were tight. And then you end up doing 50, 75, 75, 75, because you've you've gotten so far behind. So I guess Japan, where our head, my head's at is exactly that question, right? Is what's the the neutral rate in Japan? Well, it's not minus three. If you've achieved your policy objectives, I mean, worst case, the neutral rate is zero, zero real. So you're, you know, you're which then implies like a nominal a, rate of two, two and a half, something like that, two and yeah. a half percent. Because yeah. inflation in Japan, depending on what measure you look at, you know, is like two, yeah. three, three and a half, some some range yeah. within that. Yeah. So, so, so you know, how how yeah. quickly do they get there? And you know, the the, the you know, the, it reminds me. I've had some conversations recently with Bank of Japan folks. You know, it reminds me of what was getting said by the Fed and the ECB and the RBA exactly two years ago when they were acting as though their first, you know, hike, you know, the ECB hiking to zero, that that would somehow be tight. And yet they're still running massive negative real rates and the whole thing's running away from them. And so they end up having to catch up far quicker. So the, you know, the question, you know, Japan will tell you, I'm sure Bank of Japan folks will tell you, I'm sure you wait a, you know, says it as subtle as he can. Yes, we're going to normalize, but it's going to be a very gradual, slow path. And you see the response yesterday as though what they did is meaningless, which it is, it is meaningless what they did yesterday, you know, hiking from minus 10 basis points to zero when it's been trading at zero all along, because they never really could structurally impose the negative interest rate doesn't really matter in the you know of formally saying we ended ycc which they technically ended in october and 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 yet we're still going to do fixed rate operations anytime we think yields are too high and buy unlimited amounts of bond and we're and we're going to stop etf buying well the stock market's up 50 percent you know the last 18 months so that's not a big deal but we're still going to do qe and we're still going to buy the same amount of rin bands and and so you know you see obviously today the you know inevitably the pressure the currency will put the pressure back on them again so you know dollar yen's gone higher and you know cny yen's at new all-time highs right now and and so that pressure starts to build and the, i think we even talked about this back then that you know the you know japan's putting pressure on china because they're debasing their currency as trying this trying to keep their currency stable and and everybody keeps telling me the same thing that they've been telling us for two years uh that, you know, the Fed's going to cause a recession. And so we don't have to hike as much as you would think, you know, looking at us as a, in a silo basis. And so the Fed's going to cause a recession and, and, you know, we've been pricing 
interest rate cuts in you know a year out since two years ago yeah I mean, we have virtually yeah. the entire way up we've been pricing that you know they're gonna you know two years ago in the u.s i can't remember you know you were pricing three hikes and then cuts yeah and you know they ended up doing whatever i mean what would you what do you make of that you know because th in this cycle in particular the market has been so kind of forward looking it, it you know it wants to kind of just look past the hiking cycle and go straight to the cuts it yeah. wants to kind of perfectly price the hike and then the cuts yeah, you know, I don't remember that happening uh, in the 2000s, nor in the 1990s. At least that, I mean, for the period I've been in, in markets, yeah. it's, it's it's really the market really wants to kind of full the price the full cycle up and down. You know, it's been unusual. You know, it, it sort of notoriously, central banks never forecast recessions until this time. Bank of England's been forecasting a recession since December 2021. And they've continued to forecast the re recession over and over. Now, my argument is, and again, we talked about this two and a half years ago, you know, the 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 fragility of the system, the systemic risk that's out there, it's pretty obvious to see. It's the uncapitalized, uncapitalized holding of fixed income. The fact that most obviously banks, Silicon Valley Bank, can hold duration sovereign bonds as zero risk weighted assets and hold to maturity accounting. And so you've got these massive exposures, Bank of America's unrealized losses, you know, that's publicly known in the system with no capital to support these unrealized accumulated losses. And that flows through from the banking system where they're treated as zero RWAs to pension funds in the UK, liability driven investment schemes where levering long dated guilt is risk reducing, right? So you, you have all this problem where the methodology around treating, you know, the sort of uh, regulatory accounting capital guidelines of financial institutions in the system were used as a tool, I would argue, as a tool of financial repression to absorb a mass proliferation of government debt as every government in the world blew through 100% of debt to GDP at all-time lows of interest rates. And now the pressure of the destabilizing pressure of, of losses accumulated on those things that don't get accounted for, don't get, that aren't capitalized has had this incentive to, you know, keep the back end from melting down. And so at first, I think central banks thought, well, you do that by, you know, uh, reducing the uh, fears of inflation, even as it runs away. And then when that fear gets recognized and back end starts selling off, well, then you have to hike even more aggressively because you need to invert the yield curve. You need to convince people that you're going to get to the recession soon. So they hold on to the back end. You can't have these guys liquidating these back end positions because, as I famously say over and over again, who's going to own the bonds? And so then you get to the progression, then gets to what now is, you know, commonly talked about uh, fiscal dominance, this fiscal dominance issue where you know, led by my old econ professor, uh, Professor Yellen, you know, she's got bonds to issue. She's got a lot of them. So I guess I guess what you're saying is that the banks and, and various other parts of the financial industry are, um, in essence, long bonds and uh, central bankers and uh, fiscal and, and monetary and, and, and treasuries you know, are aware of that and they'll do whatever it takes to make sure the long end doesn't sell off. So you have this kind of paradox where on the one hand, they're hiking at the, using the short end of the curve, but on the other hand, they're keeping an eye on the long end and they'll do whatever it takes to keep the long end well, well, you know, anchored. Yeah. And so you end up in this situation where you don't have a proper tightening cycle, you know, where the whole curve moves up and, and, you know, yeah. in, in, instead you, you kind of have this more limited path through of monetary policy. And and here we are today with very loose financial conditions. Stocks are up, Bitcoin's up, and 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 you know no, no recession. I think that's a great description, right? And and I wrote last month in my piece that just came out last week. Uh, you know, you you see these moves afoot of justifying why every central bank, ECB, Bank of England, Fed, isn't going to QT to the same extent they QE'd, right? So they're going to maintain these larger balance sheets. You know, far, far larger, you know, in the case of Bank of England, 47 times larger than it was, you know, pre-GFC. 
and they're you know re-justifying what was justified the QE as an asset side monetary policy tool, right? We're going to expand our balance sheet, our owning of assets as a tool to compress risk premia in the system. But now they're redefining sticking with these big balance sheets, ending QT far before they've taken off all these assets as a liability side financial stability issue. Bank reserves need to be this big now because that's good for financial stability, which wasn't part of the conversation at all. In fact, quite the opposite, right? When they were doing QE, Bernanke most explicitly saying, this won't be inflationary because it's temporary (laughs) because the money's coming will come back out because we'll wind it back down again. Well, now it's permanent, as they say, we need to have these massive bank reserves to make the financial system stable. And again, it's just financial repression effectively, right? Mm. Hold on to these bonds. And so, you know. And they moved the goalposts in essence from what what they said originally. Um, Yeah. And then, you know, I I noted in that thing, this, the letter that came from ISDA to the the Fed and the FDIC and the uh, comptroller saying, we think you should make the exemption of treasuries from the SLR, the statutory liquidity ratio, permanent, the one that was put in place in March 2020, which is effectively the gross leverage ratio that was the, the, the one actual change in risk after GFC by Basel was kind of imposing a gross leverage ratio, not just the tier one risk-weighted assets. And now they want to make an exemption of that permanent so the banks can hold infinite amounts of treasuries and and then Jay Powell blurting out at the congressional hearing that uh, they're totally overhauling what's been going on about Basel III in-game and higher capital requirements for the bank. He's just chucking it. So again, this all comes back to somebody's got to own these bonds and you can see the sort of mechanism, the machinations of policymakers working actively at the moment to make sure at least the banks are going to own the bonds and that the central banks are going to eventually stop letting theirs run off. Not like they're selling any, they're just letting them run off. Um, and yeah, so I, I still mean, think I, that's you know, the I big guess, problem. I guess, you know, unlike sort of previous uh, sort of leverage cycles, so for example, subprime, you basically had a risk asset, you know, property, mm-hmm. subprime, build up, and then banks holding them, they leverage up the bank balance sheet, then that, that blew up. Um, you know, this time the risk is in bonds, you know, treasuries, you know, which is, you know, the heart of the system. And so you you kind of know you have the government to back you there. And and so I'm just wondering in terms of how this plays out in terms of some kind of risk event, systemic risk mm. event. You know, last year, of course, we had the regional bank crisis, which right. led up, I mean, that, that could have brought the whole system to, to the brink. But of course, you know, we had a, yeah, yeah, we, we had this array of policies that came, in, came into play. So what I'm always trying to work out is like, you know, how's the crisis going to look? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what, you know, my opinion, and again, I, you know, you know I notoriously don't predict what's going to happen. I just describe what I see and and what I see and what I think the market sees, uh, you know, like the Bitcoin market seems to see it the best is this fiscal dominance problem, right? They, they don't have the will to slay inflation because they need to absorb these bonds and the only people that are going to eventually buy the bonds that that yields the governments can afford are the central banks and the regulated institutions that get special treatment to own bonds right infinite leverage and no accounting requirements and you can pay yourself annual bonuses on the carry right so you know pension funds and insurance you know solvency two where duration bonds are a lower capital requirement than cash and you know stuff like that so it strikes me and it, i think it strikes bitcoin or nvidia investors or uh, that that they're unwilling to drain sufficient liquidity out of the system to take the froth out and so the assumption i believe in that world is is inevitably they're going to eventually buy the bonds again and if they're going to buy the bonds again I want to own everything but the, I want to own the most speculative asset I can find. I want to own real assets. I want to own Bitcoin. I want to own tech stocks. I want to own, you know, the stuff that exploded higher in 2021 when they weren't going to fight inflation. And, and I think people, but in that's the end, kind of I, the I suppose what we're saying is that, uh, the inflation dragon hasn't been slain, you know? Yeah. So, you know, we, we've, 
you know, so, so what, I mean, what do you make of the recent decline in inflation? Because central yeah. banks all patting themselves on the back saying, you know, we won, you know, it's, it's coming down. You know, if you look at like three months, six months, annualized yeah. month to month rates, yeah. core PCE, you know, whatever, yeah. you know, it's, it's yeah. running around two, two and a half percent in the US. So we're, we're good. I'm sure with not too much effort, you and I could go back and show how often they talked about base effect in 2021 and how seldom they talk about base effect now, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. You know, the UK was, I, I think, 10.4 year on year a year ago and 3.4 today. But you're, 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 you're plus 3.4 on a price level of something that was plus 10.4 the year before. Yeah. So you're, you're still compounding at a pretty good pace over this yeah. period of time. And you know, obviously the talk, and you can see it most clearly in the U S where, you know, we really haven't had a, a decline in the year on year rate of inflation since July of last year. It's, it's flatlined. And I, I, I think it was Goldman who had a story overnight saying, you know, 3% is the new target. It's not 2%, it's 3%. Now, lots of people talking about that and saying they should do that. For obvious reasons, I think the Fed would never publicly say they're doing that. They're certainly going to at least tell people they're still fighting for two percent. Their actions may say otherwise. And, and, and so, I mean, what do you make of um, the inflation markets in the U.S. like tips? Because that's been relatively well anchored. You know, five year, five years yeah. well anchored. So, is that a case of you? You know, is the is the tips mark a tips market somehow um, manipulated in in some form, or is it that you, you can still fool a lot of people a lot of the time until they're not fooled. Yeah. It's, it's just that people, there's so much credibility built up and everybody yeah. kind of talks to the same people and they, and they believe the story. You know, it's, uh, again, tips is a, you know, relatively speaking, tips is a niche market, right? Yeah. That you, your, your, your common investor isn't investing in trading, holding tips. It's very institutionally driven market and those institutions have regulatory capital reasons for why they own things that aren't necessarily economic justified it would be my opinion tips has not been a good pricer of future inflation lately very right. fact for a very very long time it has not been a good pricer of future inflation and i mean right. what do you make of surveys like consumer surveys of inflation like michigan you know things like that i mean they they've also been relatively yeah. well well behaved i mean the yeah. one year expectations tend to follow oil prices but the longer ones like michigan 5 year that that's been relatively well behaved yeah um you know i i i think uh i mean one one thing i i found is that you you have this paradox where people have relatively well anchored inflation expectations. But then when you look at surveys of their views on inflation, they say they they hate inflation is rampant. You know, so these yeah. consumer surveys, yeah. consumer confidence seems to say. follow price levels. So there's something between price levels and inflation rate. So yeah. as you were yeah. saying earlier, base effects that people want prices to come down to to, yeah. you know, um so so there's something that odd going on. We're, we're kind of not used to an inflation environment where there's this levels versus changes uh, effect. I, I wrote some about it now and again. I think it comes down to skin in the game, right? Where you have skin in the game, the price level matters. And, yeah. and, 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 your, and your behavior is to protect against really high inflation or really bad disinflation or the risk of deflation. When you're when you're forecasting, you're trying to hit the mean, but the mean doesn't really matter, right? In the real world, it's the it's the wings that matter. It's the it's the risks that matter, and so people go out and behave, and you can see that in how asset prices behave, or how speculative assets behave, or how home prices behave, or the you know are people taking out mortgages to buy homes, or eh, far more so than what you see in surveys or regulated financial institution activities is my opinion i you know skin in the game makes a big difference in how people behave and you know and i i firmly you know i always show the picture of of the price level of the index and you know going up 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 forever and say you know anytime somebody asks me the question is it transitory i say look at this line show me where it was ever transitory 
<laughs> you know, since 1971, it has not been transitory. It's been constant, right? Uh, you can say that the year-on-year -year change goes up and down, but there's, you know, the they're targeting a debasement of the currency. Now that may express itself in asset prices, as we saw from 2008 till 2022. It may spin into consumer price indexes as a you know, as a as a small measure of where that money and credit expansion is going in a window of 2021 and 2022 and 2023, but the money and credit expansion is persistent and relentless. Yeah. And and their answer, you know, their answer to and this is why I still think, you know, that the, the fiscal dominance issue will keep inflation at least volatile, if not high, but volatile. Because this need to fund themselves creates this fragility and the, you know, additional tightrope challenge of the central bank. Jay Powell is walking a little bit of a tightrope and and he's trying to tighten and, you know, Janet's running it down her account and spending money willy nilly and offsetting, you know, his financial conditions can never get tight enough. And, and yet, you know, I'm, you know, he, he, you can't help but notice that when the banks are choking on it. They have a word with her and she reduces her duration issuance for the November funding announcement. Yeah, it's, it you seems know. like since uh, last year's kind of QRA term premium blowout, there's been this really quite yeah. effective uh, management yeah. by the Treasury, the US Treasury, to make sure that the QRA is such that uh, the bills are managed so that you don't get a term premium blowout. Now, this this fiscal dominance theme sounds really interesting. So, I mean, how would you position your portfolio in, in such a situation? Because you're, you know, on the one hand, you have this sort of risk rally, you know, because, you know, uh, financial conditions are too, too loose and everyone's incentivized to keep it like that. But you have these tails, the wings, as you say. Yeah. So, so how, you know, how do you construct your, your portfolio like in, in this environment? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, again, you know, our, our point of view and what we work with our investors on is, is get good risk mitigation and take more participating risk, right? I, you know, my, my criticism of what I rudely call sharp world, the, the financial consensus and maths of our time is that risk management is just reducing risk, right? You, 60, 40, you know, Kelly criterion, you de-lever your risk taking, you take 40% out of your growth asset, your compounding asset and hold it in something riskless bonds. Now during the Greenspan put era, you had this temporary benefit of a slight negative correlation do the central bank reaction function of cutting rates when equity markets fell. Now, obviously, when rates got to zero, that was no more. And you may recall my December 2020 update titled "Inflation is upon us, 6040 is dead." And you know, and it died. It, it, it <laughs> yeah, died, uh, right? Yeah. And and I will argue it's still dead. And, and you know, the are what we advocate, you know, Nassim Taleb mentality of get really explicit negatively correlating asymmetric risk mitigation and put more money to work take more risk so in in my you know race car analogy put good brakes on your car so you can drive faster don't try to estimate future curves and drive at the average speed that you probably won't crash because you're missing the best opportunities of the fastest part and you're taking way too much risk in unforeseen future curves. Better put brakes on your car and drive fast. Get mo free money up from these things that neither participate nor protect. And so, you know, and this obviously has been enormously successful of late because the participating assets have done extraordinarily well. And if you protected in 2022 and 2020 and 2018, cut off any negative compounds or this compounding benefit has been astronomical to, to clients, right? Way better than driving average lap speed, way better than 60-40 or, or you know, high-tech versions of that, call it risk parity and stuff like that. And, and the better so, protection, does that come in the form of options? So basically you want to be long w the wings in different asset classes. Is that the best way yeah. of expressing this? Yeah, so you know what we do is own convexity. Now, the most common form of that is in options, but there's more complex ways that that gets done. 
And, and then, the, you know, the trick is doing that efficiently because obviously doing that is, is difficult because it comes with a cost. It, it's relationship with time is fundamentally different. You, you know, you're, you're losing sensitivity through time, which is good when you're taking risk, bad when you're mitigating risk, right? You want to maintain sensitivity. And so it's a, you know, I, I, jumping analogies, it's you know, my, my football analogy, it's a goalkeeper. A goalkeeper is a very different function and activity than being a goal scorer. And, and, you know, as I always say, particularly challenging in an industry where the singular metric for performance and incentive is goal scoring. Mm -hmm. And yet the most important thing in the terminal capital compounding outcome of the game is goal prevention. Yeah. And so the, the goalkeeper is the most important guy in the pitch, but we've simplified it because again, we're, you know, the fiduciary doesn't have skin in the game. So he simplified everything down to an annual arithmetic return goal scored per game, not standings at the end of the season. And, uh, and even uh, things like sharp year. ratios, Saltino yeah. ratios, returns over drawdown, all, you know, all of these things people have come up with. You don't buy into any yeah. of those. <laughs> well, but, you know, not sharp into, ratio. But, I mean, they down enough, I should say. Yeah. The sharp, sharp ratio is total nonsense, right? Because it's literally rewarding you for reducing risk. It's treating upside volatility as an equivalent to downside volatility, which mathematically is wrong, right? The, you know, the impact of the negative compound is greater than the impact of the positive compound. But, but just commonsensically, upside volatility is good. Why are you rewarding fiduciaries to reduce their participation in the upside? You, you know, you're, you're literally trying to reward people who got closest to guessing lap by lap what the right average lap speed would be, as opposed to rewarding the guy who created the most separation every lap, the compounding. All right? So Sortino is a much better thing because it's measuring downside vol, which is the risk that you do want to mitigate and how much can you perform. So yeah, a simple ratio of what's a a better investment strategy than another, the investment strategy whose total vol over its downside vol is a bigger number is the better strategy because it's going to compound better. It's going to drive the fastest in good times and have the best breaks in bad times. And now, like I said, doing that, playing goalkeeper, being the breaks is different because most people haven't grown up doing it, right? They've grown up learning about investment, learning modern portfolio theory and visit my market hypothesis and simplifying as as you know, Hayek says in his famous Nobel Prize lecture, they've decided to define as important that which they can measure, as opposed to trying to measure what's important, right? And so they simplify the complicated things and say, well, assuming correlations and volatilities remain constant, then my expected return based upon a backward look of historical correlations is this. And so everybody targets the mean of the expected outcome which we never actually realize because the mean happens to be the average of the divergences and the divergences then are disbenefits to their relative performance. Now, the trick is to turn your portfolio around from targeting the mean of frequency to targeting the variance, the, the divergence, so that dis divergences are a benefit to your portfolio's relative performance. And it just means turning upside down how you think about the magnitude of returns versus the frequency and that's of convexity. returns. Yeah, uh, and that's convexity. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and one, I mean, one, 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 you know, pushback I often hear when when one talks about this with clients is, that let, let's say I've got a hundred billion dollar um, real money fund, you know, equities. Mm -hmm. It's sixty forty equities. I mean, how how can I buy options to be able to mitigate risk if if, if my portfolio is so large? So I have yeah. to then go into cash or you know delta one or, or you know just have to buy other assets. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, the entire system being long an asset in essence is foregoing liquidity for a return is short optionality. Being long a liability is paying a fee to store liquidity. So by definition, there's as many uh, positively convex opportunities as there are negatively convex exposures, right? So the entire system is trying to earn, and then you know, by far the greatest convexity machine are banks, right? Because they have all these government underwritten monopolistic deposits, positive convexity, 
that they get credit, you know, non-recourse leverage, they get incredibly cheap, that they then go out and lend at a much higher rate, and they get to keep all the profit. And if they don't get paid back, they don't have to pay back the depositor. Well, that's the same thing buying an option, right? It, an option is just non-recourse leverage, right? If I if I buy a put option on the S&P and I go and own the S&P, I get all the upside and somebody else gets all the downside for a fee. And there's unlimited amounts of that because you know, you know, you know incredibly well, particularly out here. And the reason we sit in Asia is that the entire you know, 35 year financially repressed Asian savings base has been trained into embedding short optionality and yield enhancing investment products. And yeah. every, every deposit, every retail deposit in Singapore is a dual currency deposit embeds a short FX option. Every bond that a Taiwanese insurance company buys is callable embeds a strip of Bermudan so options. Every Korean investment product is an equity worst of auto callable structure that's short, you know, HSCEI and, yeah. and S and P knock in put options. Every corporate treasurer is doing ARFs and TARNs and range accruals, all trying to enhance yields and selling options. The option supply but in the surely world. surely isn't that because uh, implied trade above realized? <laughs> no, that's because that's because they think that depositing money at name a bank, depositing money at Citibank is profitable. Yeah. But who makes more profit, the depositor or Citibank? Citibank, yeah. Citibank. Yeah. Well, likewise, selling S&P puts is profitable. It's just a lot less profitable than buying S&P puts and owning the S&P. Yeah. Right? Because in that compounding path, getting the big upsides and cutting off the big downsides will compound massively better than the running cost of those options. And the guy who's foregoing the upside, the guy who's providing the non-recourse insurance leverage, never gets the upside and every now and again gets a really nasty downside and just gets a fee. Now, in a very short-term period, a probabilistic, that has a high probability of earning that fee. And the probability of a big up move or a big down move in a very short period is small. But over an investment path, I guarantee you get your one percentiles, right? And this again comes back to the flaws of the financial math that we all learned. They treat the world as though it's ergodic, which it's not. It's non-ergodic. And then the whole math around modern portfolio theory and Gaussian distributions and random walks and Brownian motion and all that rubbish is a you know a single slice of time, two hundred parallel universes. And in that, you say, well, geez, the one percentiles, I, very low probability. So I'm going to ignore it. But your path through time, I guarantee you get your one percentiles, and I guarantee those one percentiles are the drivers of the compounding. Right? You, and I guess equally this. in that example, the uh, ergodicity argument is what you've just described, cross-section versus sort of time. Um, yeah. What's also important is you have to survive. That, yeah. That's like it's, rule number one is survive, to be able correct. to capture those upsides. So what you don't want is you don't want to get wiped out, which is where... Yeah. Uh, you, you've got to do the risk mitigation in a way where you you stay in the game to be able to compound yeah. over time. Yeah. Yeah. Back to my, my race car analogy, right? Yeah. Brakes, right? The, by, you know, without any doubt, ask any race car driver, the guy who wins the race was the guy with the best brakes because he finished and he could go the fastest. Yeah. Now at the end of the race, nobody really knows how to measure the contribution of the brakes. They measure speed. Right. But he knows he won because he had the best brakes. Because the guy without good brakes who tried to drive fast crashed, didn't finish. To your point, time failed the time problem. Right. And the guy who knew he didn't have good brakes drove so slowly that he didn't matter. He was targeting average lap speed and missed all the convexity, the acceleration and deceleration. And that relative performance away from the average is what will drive the non-ergodic path through time. And this is really kind of the big flaw. And you know, because remember in the fiduciary world, the guy racing the car is doing it remotely. He's not actually in the car. So he's not that concerned about the brakes. And he believes he starts over equal every lap. His compensation cycle starts over the next lap. So compounding, you know, the biggest flaw in the system is that there's not a metric 
for geometric compounding and that we've simplified everything down to arithmetic returns and annual compensation cycles, which is is you know, why everyone targets the mean and says, well, probability of frequency is more important than magnitude of impact. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's so pervasive. I mean, I speak to some of the smartest investors in the world. And when I sort of talk about certain uh, investments or trades, they ask me, for, the first thing they ask me, is it positive carry? Is the role <laughs> positive? You know, that that's the first thing they ask often. Um, yeah. You know, otherwise they won't entertain the, the you know the whole idea. So it's it's so kind of pervasive. Just getting that daily, yeah. you know, fix of of, of, of a return. Uh, but there's no free lunch. <laughs> you know, if 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 you want well, that, then as I say all the time, people you know, people obviously will ask me you know about carry or about theta. Yeah. I always say theta is your investment in improved compounding. How much are you willing to invest in better compounding? It's not a cost. Just like positive carry is not a return. We all know it, right? How many times have these carry junkies, levered carry, found out that it's long-term negative expected return? Back to my point, right? The the provision of non-recourse leverage, not nearly as attractive as taking on that non-recourse leverage and owning the risk through a longer period of you know, a compounding cycle, right? Mm. And yet, because you've, again, you've simplified the measurement by shortening it and probabilistic frequencying it, that you know, you know, in, in a short enough time frame, carry looks like the highest probability. We, if we're if we're only looking you're right. at you're one, you're right. So it depends on the time frame that you're right. looking at. So it seems like our system is such that the time frames have been narrowed so much. It, yeah. it, it, it you know it necessarily makes you more favorable towards carry and arithmetic returns and away yeah. from like compounding. And stuff Warren Buffett talks about Taleb, you know, and and, yeah. and what you're talking about here. So yeah, it comes it's like compound, staying in the game and compound. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and really participating. I mean, you know, the biggest mistake I see when I speak to, you know, pension funds, endowments, you know, mm. long long term investors, they, they don't take enough risk, right? They're, they're driving at the average lap speed, and they don't have any breaks. They don't have any good risk mitigation because they've owned all these bonds, right? Whether it's sixty forty, whatever their benchmark is, and. Uh, and if you can get their head around, listen, risk mitigate, pay some theta, go and take risk. You'll be shocked how easy it is to pay for that theta in in you know a year when Nasdaq's up fifty five percent like last year. If you how much extra Nasdaq did you need to own? Not very much. And given that I mean, you I... know things like Nasdaq and S and P and Bitcoin and Nvidia are all correlated, if you've got something that's effectively nor negative correlated own the 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 higher beta of those and that's how you compound that's how you grow wealth yeah i mean i and i mean what, what do you make of i mean a related point then in terms of when nasdaq's doing well it's it's easy to predict yourself i mean what do you make of the low level of volatility in markets right now i mean uh, equity vol is relatively low i guess vix has picked up a bit but it's relatively low move the rates vol is very low fx volatility is very low yeah um you know volatility like everything, it's driven by supply and demand, and and be, you know, uh, again because of the risk methodology, value at risk being the most simple example, is incredibly pro cyclical, right? So, the 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 lower volatility is, the more risk you can take, right? And if if your definition of risk taking is basically foregoing liquidity, earning carry, selling volatility, whatever form that is. It, you know, it's self-fulfilling. It, it builds upon itself until it reverses and then becomes very reflexive the other way where there's not enough capital to absorb the losses because people don't correctly account for the power law of nature. It's not a normal distribution. Surprise, surprise, right? And then it has fat tails and and often, you know, asymmetric fat tails. And and so we're in this, you know, sort of wonderful period. You know, you, know, you had such a fantastic year last year so again, guys who had efficient risk mitigation through 2022 and maintained their risk come into 2023 risked up. Now, the reason that stocks had such an explosive year is because everybody de-risked in 2022 because their risk mitigant fixed income positively correlated in a down market, killed them. And so their solution to that is own less equities and own more bonds because their risk mitigation doesn't work, so you can't take as much risk. And then what happens? They're chasing the equity markets all the way up. 
but the guy who had the convexity, he didn't de-risk in 2022. He's fully risked up, you know, juiced risked up in 2023, benefits in it, and gets to the end of 2023 and says, where are we now? Oh, the vol I've been using to hedge my risk is even cheaper than it was a year ago. Let's go for it. Right. And so, you know, again, for the guy, you know, the, the, the put buyer and own the risk had a great last year, had a great this year. The put seller looks like he's doing good, but he's falling behind in the race. Right. Even yeah. though, you know, you know, and so it, it, eventually though, that put seller has to, the, the carry guy, the put seller, the, you know, he has to apply more leverage to keep meeting the same return target because vol's getting lower, carry's getting lower, right? And then eventually that become, you know, it hits some sort of magic, you know, the, the house price start, stops going up and then it suddenly starts going back down again because of all the leverage that's built up. It's got to maintain that progress. And so, you know, it's a great environment for us because it's easy for us to go and find really attractive, asymmetric, long convexity opportunities and to isolate, you know, we're, and you'll hear Nassim talk about this or Mark Spitznagel. You know, we're really focused on third and fourth moment stuff. We're really looking for skew and convexity and vol of vol. We're not even, you know, we're not really in the low asymmetry world of of gamma or even vega to some extent, right? It's yeah. more third moment, fourth moment. So it's a great environment for us. And it's uh, it's been, you know, huge. Now, obviously, you know, what, what drives the ability to continue running this is the continued correlation. The fact that when these dislocation events come, they're driven by a, a rise in correlation. Right now, I, you know, you know, we can't hedge Nvidia if Nvidia is the only thing that goes back down. But if you know Nasdaq goes down, but at the same time S and P goes down, at the same time FX carry trades get unwound, at the same time back in bond sell off, then it's very easy for us to construct hedges for the systemic correlation risk that allow people to run things that seem to move in a correlated manner. And you know, up to the investor to make the decisions about the idiosyncratic risk they want to take. Do they want to run something that's NASDAQ or do they want to just put everything in NVIDIA? No. That's taken a lot of idiosyncratic risk that may or may not, you know, respond to mm. correlated shocks. And just just going back to what you were saying about third and fourth moment. So just to kind of uh, keep it easy for our audience as well. So no. let, let's say I, I'm long uh, US stocks and mm. what I can do is I can buy um, uh, equity puts as a way yeah. of getting some um, risk mitigation. So that's a fairly... Uh, kind of simple way of using, right. you know, options. But now you mentioned vol of vol, third, fourth moments. What's an example of a structure that would capture the third or fourth moment? So I, I just talked about buying a put. Yeah. You could buy straddle, which uh, if you hedge it, it gives you exposure to Vega. Yeah. But what, what's the third and fourth moment? Uh, yeah, so so the example in the US and the S&P, which is easy, it's VIX, right? So VIX is, is essentially like variance. So it's convex more convex than just fixed strike vega because it maintains its uh vega sensitivity regardless of what the strike is right it doesn't have a strike so it, it can continue now the that the fourth moment is the volatility of volatility which is options on vix right and so that's true convexity right? now that's the only place where that exists in an easy to trade there's a future on VIX and there's options on the futures on VIX. Virtually no other market is, is that accessible, which means it's generally the most expensive market for volatility and convexity in the world because it's the easiest place to go and buy it. And so that's where a preponderance of hedging gets concentrated and far, far too many people. And, you know, my criticism, not criticism, my tease of people like, Mark Spitznagel and so many people who sell themselves as tail risk hedgers, I say, well, no, you're S and P hedgers. You're not tail risk hedgers because you're only focusing on one specific thing. And if that doesn't happen to be part of, you know, S and P hedges were not efficient hedges 
for the breakdown and correlation of 60-40 portfolios or risk parity in 2022 because they were too expensive when you bought them because so much demand had gone in there in anticipation that these bonds aren't going to be a good hedge. But the correct hedge has to do with the correlation relationship across multi-asset portfolios. And in that particular example, obviously, the correct hedge was interest rates. That's where volatility exploded. And it exploded because it was far too cheap because everyone was selling it in 2020 and 2021 while they were all buying uh, S&P vol. So, so, you know, the complexity, and this is, again, why, you know, don't do this at home. So, you know, most of what guys like us do is not accessible to the, to the retail trader. You know, you can see the performance of most of the things that have been somehow packaged into an ETF. Yeah, the the long VIX ETFs are are, are death traps. Uh, you know, other things I won't name anybody's particular ETF, you know, but as sad, a general yeah. rule, <laughs> yeah. it hasn't worked good. But if you look at the at the you know hedge fund index of long vol or tail risk guys, they do really really well. You pair them together with S and P risk and equalize the risk to what a sixty forty or all equity would look like, and it outperforms every time because of this compounding benefit. But there must be something to the efficiency of that, of being able to go out and construct that exposure. So, you know, the, the simple way to construct a lot of those exposures, like skew. So think of the third moment as skew, that what's priced in terms of the change in volatility should the market go down. All right. Well, the way somebody could do that or would do that, again, don't do this at home. You trade what we call a put ratio, right? You would you would sell one time a nearer the money put to own multiple times the out of the money put, and try to isolate that difference in vol pricing between the near the money the price and the out of the money price when it's cheap, and then manage the complexity of that, which is complex because you have a diverse decay of all the Greeks because you've got split strikes and notionals and stuff and different sensitivities through time. But that becomes very, very sensitive to changes in skew, right? Um, uh, now, yeah, of course, no, in the profe- yeah. you know, in the <laughs> professional market, we have products, you know, the ultimate sort of convex products, a, a variant swap, right? So that in a perfect world at the right price, you know, our entire strategy would be variant swaps because it's just pure. I get paid the daily variance, volatility squared on realized volatility and I own all that convexity, the squared function of volatility, you know, throughout whatever the time that we've structured the swap. So I get the daily realized and the change in implied price is squared. Anything happens. Now, the problem is that's such a good tool as a hedge and such a bad tool to be on the wrong side of people don't want to sell it to you. And when they do sell it to you, they want to sell it to you at a massive premium and that massive premium makes it cost ineffective. But at times where supply and demand dynamics might get imbalanced because of flows of structured product activity or or regulatory capital accounting requirements, guys will come along and want to sell that to you at the exact price and time that you should buy it. But you have to have ISDAs and variation margin arrangements, segregated margin accounts, and you know you have to be a professional to function in that world. And, and... yeah, yeah. And and just to round off kind of this part of our conversation, uh, for this year, 2024, what what what, what are the things that are, are really worrying you? Well, I, yeah, I, we, I have this conversation. All, people ask me all the time because people like you know me and know that I've been around and seen quite a lot. So they say, oh, Dave, what you must do is you figure out where you think the tail risks are, and then you go out and buy options on it. And I always say it's, in fact, exactly the opposite. Mm-hmm. I go out and buy options where the volatility or the price of convexity is cheap. Eventually, if I buy enough of those, it tells me where the tail risks are, because that's explicitly the unlevered ri- the, the levered risk, the uncapitalized risk that will be where the biggest land. Well, you know, it's the part of the forest where the most dry brush and trees have built up, such that when the fire starts, whether it's a lightning strike over here or kids playing with matches over there, some exogenous event that's completely unpredictable. What we're protecting against is the contagion effect, the correlation, as that fire leaps from tree to tree to tree. The lightning only catches one tree on fire, right? And we just need to figure out where the the most clogged up dry brush and stuff is. And that's where conveniently, again, I always say this, I said this to you, don't tell anybody. That's where the price of the insurance is the cheapest, right? That's super senior tranches of subprime CDOs. 
They were the biggest risk to the C system at precisely the time you could have taken the other side for the least cost because the leverage that had been applied to them as tranched up as zero risk weighted assets collapsed their spread to U.S. Treasuries to nothing. And so we're, for, for the layperson who's not sophisticated, one one rule of thumb could be where implied vol is very low. Uh, yeah, so if, if it's very low relative to history, that tells you that, look, something could yeah. be going on there. Or if spreads in certain markets are incredibly tight, then it tells you, okay, yeah. nobody's worried about any Correct. risks there. So these are all like uh, areas which you need to keep an eye on. Spot on, right? This is a, a, a Nassimism. Nassim says, if you're buying an option for a reason, don't do it. It must be priced in, right? Mm -hmm only buy it because it's mispriced or it's cheap. There's value in it. And so exactly to your point, what we do and what we would advise your listeners to the extent they want to try, don't focus on, you know, don't focus on your view, focus on an understanding of the value. So it's just like a, an equity investor, you know, whether you like the company or don't like the company isn't what matters. What matters is the price you could buy it at. And it's the same thing with volatility, and convexity. Find things that are low, that are cheap, that are there's you know some sort of supply and demand dynamic. You know, we, we think of ourselves as being sort of the the volatility equivalent of a distressed credit investor. You know, I'll buy anything at ten cents on the dollar. Just come and show it to me, right? You know, if, and then it's my job to keep it functioning for the two years, three years, five years that I'm going to own it, waiting for the market to deliquify and go the other way. In the distressed distress credit world, it's keeping the company alive until the markets reliquify and everything goes up, right? And so it's about price and value and then understanding what's indicative of that. And and so, you know, again, the VIX and S&P is a great example because to the, to the simple eye, and obviously, I have this conversation a lot with my friends that are in that business. People say, well, look how low the VIX is. But for starters, you can't trade the VIX, right? That's a spot price that's untradeable. You trade the future. And you start looking at the futures curve, and those prices are a lot higher than the spot VIX price. So immediately, you can say, well, wait, there's a significant roll down. If I buy that, if I buy the six-month VIX future, which... You know, still to me, very short term, but a reasonable time horizon where some sort of dislocation might evolve. Well, you got to buy, you got to pay 21 for that. Spot VIX is at 13. So you're already got eight balls of loss just waiting. Right? Now, when you see a lot of vol supply and a compression, so right now there is a lot of vol supply in the S&P, but it's zero DTE. It's one day. Who cares about one day leverage? One day, if you're if you're on the wrong side of one day leverage, all I have to do is cut your your delta, your exposure to the S and P, because tomorrow you you don't have to. There's no leverage to unwind. Now, if you'd done that, you know, in 2000 and well, if you'd done that in 2021 as a Korean investor on three year auto call structures on Chinese stocks, you're still getting killed. Right. And and it melted and, and just down. Your point on the VIX futures there. So what you're saying there is that actually if you look further out the curve of VIX futures, the market is pricing something, some risk mm -hmm. there. So yeah. so so maybe that's not where you need to look necessarily. Or it's it's yeah, not so, clear that that's the 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 risk market you should buy. Um, yeah, what you can what you you know, just a simple explanation. You can see that the term structure is very, very steep in VIX. And what that might be saying is there are sellers of all, but in the very, very, very front end. And there must be buyers of all on the back end because they're paying eight vols yeah, more six deep. months yeah. out. Yeah. And then what you see always happens in the VIX and not necessarily everywhere else, when there's a dislocation, the back end hardly moves because that's where everybody's long. And the front end skyrockets and the curve inverts really quick because everyone's short in the front end, but everybody's long in the back end. A, a, a better hedging market would be like in Asia, pre-GFC, when all the supply meant that the back ends were trading lower than the front ends. And when, when 2008 happened, guys had to come and unwind three-year, five-year short volatility structures. Again, it's like breaking a five-year deposit. When you call a bank and you want to break a five-year deposit when there's no liquidity in the system, 
you're going to get your eyes ripped out. But if you're rolling a daily deposit and there's no liquidity in the system, well, you get your money back the next day. There's no leverage in that. And so think of Vega, in essence, as leverage. Gamma is just realized vol and delta is just the underlying. So, it, you know, these zero DTE options have delta, but that's virtually it because it expires at the end of the day. It has a single day amount of gamma, but that's relatively small. How much is realized vol going to really expand anyway? It has virtually no leverage because virtually no, it has technically no Vega in a sense. I'm not exa- I, I still can't figure out how people think about that. Mm-hmm. It also has no margin, which is why it is in some ways there's some risk behind it, some unique risk, but it's not significant leverage. You're not going to be, you know, in 08, you know, while the VIX the, the, the spiked as high as 90, one year S&P vol, I think only went to 40, 45, something like that. There's nothing. Whereas out here, we were unwinding three-year COSPI variants at 150, right? Because the, the the short through the structure product, the supply of that leverage had to get unwound. The guy's got to come and unwind it because he can't sit short that leverage in that environment another day. He's done. So so you got to go and understand, you know, where's that supply and demand? How's it infecting term structure? How's it in fact affecting skew? And so the you know, you can see one of the nice things right now in S&P and other equity markets with this bull run, finally, the really penal skew to the downside for puts. So out of the money puts cost a lot more than at the money. But right now, puts are starting to cheapen and it's calls that are starting to get expensive because people were under invested for this run in equities and they've been chasing it by trying to buy calls to catch up on the top side. And then you get, you know, and so that starts to make what's more attractive and more efficient. What you've seen through last year and 2022 is that the skew was so expensive because there was so much hedging going on that every time the market went down, vol went down, didn't go up because everybody's taking profit on their puts straight away because everybody owned them. Now that's not the case, obviously. You know, the the obvious example of recent times is interest rates, right? There was so much volatility supply in these callable note structures and mortgage structures uh, post-COVID that interest rate vol across U.S., Europe, Japan, Korea, Australia got to all-time lows. By December 2020, basically every interest rate vol market in the world was at all-time low implied volatility, all-time low realized volatility, all-time low term structure, all-time low skew, all-time low convexity vol of vol pricing, all-time low uh, slope of yield curve, you know, everything was the cheapest you could ever make it. And this is what we talked about two and a half years ago, that you could buy, you could buy options, uh, you know, top side payer swaptions on interest rate swaps at the all-time lows of all that implied zero volatility of volatility if interest rates went up mm-hmm. and so you know people you know is that are you betting on interest rates going up i'm no i'm betting that if interest rates go up volatility will move off the all-time low which is a pretty safe bet right yeah yeah, yeah. well i mean we've covered so much it's so great stuff and um i just wanted to round off our conversation with books um first oh. one is we we did talk about some technical stuff on this on this uh, conversation so are there some books you would recommend to help people understand what we've talked about on on this uh, on this con- you know, like, on this uh, podcast? I can't remember what I told you last time. I, <laughs> you know, I think probably the most important book to read is Benoit Mandelbrot, The Misbehavior of Markets. And you know, Benoit Mandelbrot is a mathematician who basically disproved the fundamental math of Gaussian distributions and and random walks and stuff that markets, the markets, economies don't behave that way. They're power laws, they're fractals. And, and so that book is a very simple book to read. It's not complex. It's not mathy. It's not geeky. It's just broadly ignored for some reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's one that I think everybody needs to read and understand. Nassim's books are fantastic. Nassim Taleb, his Incerto series and Black Swan and Anti-Fragile and Random Walk down, uh, Random Walk and are, are fantastic books. I'm oh, sorry, fooled by randomness. Fooled by randomness. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, you know, uh, this is you know, this is what I'm currently reading, but that's probably not for the, you know, that's just pure <laughs> science and math. Uh, we're just weird that way. 
And are you, you know, reading I any? To... Um, I mean, just just to kind of keep it less technical. Are you reading any kind of uh, less technical books at the moment, or anything that you read? You know, my, that you've... Yeah, my my favorite book of recent time. Well, is Eddie Chancellor's The Price of Time. So uh, yeah. anybody who wants to understand the interest rate, the the history of interest rates and the the boom bubble cycle of bad monetary decisions, Eddie's you know book, which has all of history in the first half and then modern history in the second half is just fantastic. I mean, it's just absolutely, I, my mother who would never read anything to have to do with finance or economics, but reads every history book ever written. I gave it to her and she loved it because it's a history book. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. And, it, and it's really good. Yeah. And what's the best way for people to follow you and your work? Uh, so we have a little website, convex-strategies.com. And, and we post up there uh, a portion of our monthly letter that we send out to investors that I write on, we call our risk update that talks about risk and imbalances and, and bad central bank practices and, and whatever's on my mind, whatever, you know, I've been talking about during the month. And yeah, it gets and are, are those people to, to, you know, read, read all of those, they're, they're full of great um, insights and also great references as well to speeches, talks, you know, that you found very insightful from policymakers that help, help yeah. uh, illuminate things. Um, and then we post, you know, we'll we'll post this up there, and we post, you know, podcasts or interviews that get recorded up there. And uh, but the I, I really think the updates, the sort of library of updates. I don't know. I, I don't know how much is up there. Five years or so. So it's a it's a book. You know, people always say, David, why don't you write a book? I say, I already have. It's on the website. Just go and look at it. And it's great because it's a very chronological. Because as I say, as you know, I, you know, I, I don't predict. I just observe. And so it's sort of this chronology of. Hey, they're ignoring inflation. Does that mean that inflation this time they're not going to respond to it, so it's going to run away? Turns out that was a pretty good note, and and you know, so there's some interesting things in there, and and yeah. and some of the weird science and math that we play around with are what we call our our God particle project. You know, the the search <laughs> for the 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 gap between probability and possibility, and the benefit of convexity in that gap. What's the you know, if you could present value the benefit of positive convexity in the gap between the probable and the possible, you, you'd have solved some mathematical equations that were worthwhile. That's fantastic. Well, thanks a lot, David. As usual, it's it's uh, it's great to great to speak to you and great to remember the some of the, the basic principles that we should really align ourselves with. And uh, yeah, good luck with everything that you're doing. Thanks, Blau. Really good to see you. Always fun to chat. I can't believe how easy it is to just run through an hour. Great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.